So hi everyone and welcome to this video on the foundations of the utility function, a continuation on our module on the basics of the theory of consumer behavior. So in the last video, we discussed the axioms of consumer preferences, which are your uh, completeness, transitivity, continuity, monotonicity, and strict convexity axioms. Uh, what we're going to do in this video is basically formalize those assumptions using math. And the way that we do that is through the use of a utility function, which again, as I alluded to, is a function that generally measures the level of satisfaction or happiness a consumer derives from the consumption of certain goods. So let's begin our discussion on what a utility function really is. So Essentially, a utility function contains all information pertaining to the satisfaction that the consumer derives from consuming various quantities of goods. So a particular combination of uh, goods will yield to some utility value, which you can plug into the utility function and it will give that level value. Now, the utility function by technical terms is a function, so that's you, as some function of X, wherein X are your consumption bundles. And inside a consumption bundle would be uh, individual quantities of each good. Now, it's a mathematical expression of the consumer's ranking of alternative consumption bundles X according to his or her preferences. And uh, what happens is the function assigns a specific number, which we will call u. So it will assign a number u uh, when we plug it into the utility function, where uh, that number provides only a ranking or ordering of the preferences, not the intensity of satisfaction derived from the consumer. And this is what I was mentioning in the last video of utility is just an ordinal right? This is a mere ordinal measure, right? So it's some ordinal measure. By that, right, say we have a utility value 1 equal to 50, and then we have another utility value 2 being equal to 100. Well, we can obviously say that you prefer, or since utility 2 is higher than utility 1, then this implies that generally you prefer bundle x double prime, to x prime, but it will not imply that you prefer x double prime to x prime by two, twice as much, nor does it mean that if you purchase two bundles of, uh, of x prime, you would be indifferent to x double prime because that would yield you a utility value of 100, say, for example. So it's just merely an ordinal measure. It has nothing to do with the intensity or the satisfaction you derive from that consumption. Okay, now. The utility function adheres to the behavioral assumptions presented earlier. So these behavioral assumptions are essentially your axioms, right? These are the axioms we discussed in the last video. And uh, the first one, as I said, is completeness, right? So uh, in the first assumption, we said that if you can only have three options, right, to three, could be you prefer x prime to x double prime. It could be you prefer x double prime to x prime, or you could be indifferent between the two, right? If this is the case, if the first option is the case, then it implies that the utility value you get from x prime should be greater than the utility value you get from x double prime, right? That's with the first option. With the second option, it just means that the utility value you get from x prime is less then the utility value you get from x double prime. Then the last one is if you are indifferent between the two bundles, then it must be that they yield you the same exact utility value, right? So you have here a strict preference relation case and the third one is your indifference case. So that's how the utility function tends to assert our uh, axiom of completeness based on this mathematical value. The next one is of course continuous. And uh, continuity is exemplified by this. So uh, the utility function is continuous for all values of x1 greater than 0 and x2 greater than 0 in the domain of the function. Therefore, the utility function is a single valued function. So it's a single valued function that always associates a specific number for any and all possible consumption bundles. So when you plug in x1 and x2, say, for example, until xn, 
to your utility function, it will dole you out some utility value, u star, or some utility value. And it will do that all the time for as long as you belong in this particular domain. Right? So that's continuity. It has, of course, an implication too on getting the derivatives, right? Now, we impose this mathematical sort of uh, assumption on the utility function for the ease of our computation. And theoretically, it makes some sense. So we assume or we will force in our discussion that the utility function is at least, okay, note is at least, okay, twice differentiable. So I can take the derivative at least twice with respect to each good. And this just means that it has continuous first and second order partial derivatives. So continuous first and second order partial derivatives. Now, that's just uh, an exemplification of the uh, continuity assumption. Uh, it's a mere mathematical assumption at that. So it's just necessary for us to be able to use the Lagrangian techniques and the other mathematical techniques we will use in the optimization of the function to derive effectively when we get to those, the Marshall and, and the Hicksian demand functions. So we want these two properties of continuity and twice differentiability for the computation to be straightforward and meaningful. Now, of course, we have these uh, forms here. So if you recall, say we have a utility function, okay, and for the rest of the uh, term or the rest of the module, we'll assume that the utility function is a function of two goods, right? Of a function of two goods, and these two goods essentially comprise your basket or your bundle x prime or x rather. So um, what can happen is for a function to be twice differentiable, you would need to be able to get the derivative of the utility function with respect to x1. That's this first case here. And that will yield you u underscore one or what I'll refer to as u1. And then this one, you should be able to also get it with respect to the other good, which is x2, and that's denoted as u2. We will know later on that these first order partial derivatives correspond to the marginal, marginal uh, utility of each good i, right? So these first order derivatives generally correspond to your marginal utility for each good. Then, because it is twice differentiable, we can further differentiate this u1 function and this u2 function here. We can further differentiate that into u11 and u1 uh, and u22 by your second order direct, uh, uh, and you can get your second order direct partial derivatives. And this will aid us. Okay, we need this to aid in uh, proving, okay, proving uh, your strict convexity and uh, strict quasi-concavity assumptions, right? So we need those there, as well as our second order cross partial derivatives. So we need those uh, things for us to be able to prove the shape of the utility function and, this, uh, and try to put some uh, intuition behind that. So we need those uh, things computed for. That's why that's our assumption of twice differentiability. And we're going to use that to sort of prove uh, the assumptions that I listed down. So you have here your first, your second order partial, and your second order cross. Then as always, your cross are, your cross partial derivatives are equal, right, by Young's theorem. Right. So if you recall basic uh, mathematical economics, this should be equal by Young's theorem. Okay, moving forward. Okay, so by Young's theorem, as I said, u12 is equal to u21. And the assumption requires that at least one of the second order partials is a non-zero. Now, in general, we find that for a utility function, uh, the first order partial derivatives are generally positive. And this is a sort of um, uh, stems from the fact that we have our non satiation uh, uh, action. And this is the proof of that. Our non satiation action just states that um, a consumer prefers more, right, to less, right? The consumer prefers more to less. So if, if you recall the, deri uh, the definition of a partial derivative, so just to recall, if I take the derivative of the utility function 
with respect to x1, this is equal to u1, right? x1, x2, right? And uh, this u1 is essentially, okay, we, um, you will observe that this is greater than zero or positive based on our properties. And this just means that an additional, an additional uh, unit of x1 will increase utility, right? But the key part of it is what stems from our non-association assumption, holding, right, holding all other quantities of the goods such as x2 constant, right? So if this partial derivative is positive, then it means that an additional unit of x1 will increase the value of the utility, right? It will increase the total utility that you have holding the quantities of the other goods constant. And by definition, that was our sort of definition for non-satiation, that any additional consumption of one good, none less of another good, will yield a higher utility, right? So that's the derivation of that. And as I've said, we call U1 and effectively U2 as the marginal utility of additional, uh, is a marginal utility, right? And it's the additional utility from an additional consumption of good one, caterus paribus, right? And that just means that holding all other variables constant. So you don't change your consumption of good two and so on. U2 is the same concept, but for good two. And it is by, by non-satiation that we say that U1 is greater than zero and U2 is greater than zero. So those two things have to hold uh, in order for non-satiation as an axiom to hold. So what, that, what does that mean? Utility is increasing in X1 and in X2, which means that the consumer assigns a higher utility number whenever in a consumption bundle, the quantity of a good increases while the quantity of the other good remains unchanged. Okay, so that was what I've been saying earlier. Okay, another thing with the utility function is that the utility function must be strictly quasi-concave. This is where uh, the second order cross and the uh, direct partial der derivatives come into play. So for that to be true, it must be that this condition, this formula is uh, greater than zero. And this is just a mathematical formula just to determine the concavity of a particular function. And if this is greater than zero, then we say that that particular function is strictly quasi-concave. And um, what will happen is, if the utility function is strictly quasi-concave, then it means that the preferences will be strictly convex. So note, a strictly quasi-concave utility function implies that the preferences will be strictly convex and it ensures a unique optimal consumption bundle. So that strict quasi-concavity will imply strict convexity, okay? So, um, Another key concept with the utility function is a positive monotonic transformation. Now, I've said earlier that utility is a mere ordinal, right? It's an ordinal measure, right? We, it does not infer some degree of magnitude. It's not a cardinal measure. So it is reasonable to believe that you could sort of positively transform a utility function to potentially make it easier to solve without ruining the order. Uh, and without ruining uh, whatever intuition you would get from the optimization process, for as long as um, for as long as you're able to do it, uh, only for a positive uh, under the guise of a positive monotonic transformation, because it's just ordinal. You do not care about intensity; you just care about the order. When you do a positive monotonic transformation, it preserves the order while it changes the magnitude. But again, you do not care about the magnitude; you just care about the order. So this could potentially be a strategy that you would want to learn. So say a consumer is shown these two bundles, you have X prime and X double prime, okay? Now by non-satiation, a consumer will prefer X double prime to X prime. Why is that the case? Because it has the same amount of good one, but it has more of good two. So obviously you, I can make the direct conclusion that X double prime is preferred to X prime. Now the utility function values must reflect this. So for example, uh, this is a case that reflects this, right? That's a case that reflects this because this utility function is higher than this one. So four is greater than two. 
So that makes sense, right? That makes sense. This is a correct utility value. However, uh, it's not the only combination that can lead you to the correct intuition, right? So the utility function we have uh, follows through and reflects this relation. However, any other set of numbers would also satisfy this. So for example, say you had this as 100, this as 1,000, that tells you the same thing. Say this was negative three, the, this was negative one, that tells you the same thing. So don't be confused when you have negative utility values. Those things happen because again, this is just an index. You only care about the order. So the number assigned is an index value. Therefore, any positive monotonic transformation of it is also a utility index representing the same preferences. So let a utility function be the original utility function representing a particular consumer's preferences. Then what we can uh, sort of ascertain is there exists, okay, there exists some other function V, which is some positive monotonic transformation of this function. Uh, it's a positive monotonic transformation of your original utility function such that it can equivalently represent the same consumer's preferences as long as V is indeed a true positive monotonic transformation of U, right? So mathematically, right, if we can say that um, this is the case, so if we plug in the utility value inside of this positive monotonic transformation and we still pref uh, preserve the order, right, U naught, and we know that this is true, right? So if this is the, your case, so this is your case, you know that bundle one gives a higher utility than bundle zero. If you plug that value into the, uh, to this positive monotonic transformation and you get the same relation, then you can qualify V as a positive monotonic transformation, right? So it's the same uh, intuition as the old bundle, but uh, just at a different form. We don't care about the magnitude. The magnitude is not implied by the utility function. It is merely the order. So that is all that we are looking at. Okay, so we're going to answer this uh, sort of concept in another video. So stay tuned. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.